before we look at the next example, we want to, to kind of summarize something that we saw earlier um, back in chapter one on existence and the uniqueness theorems. So one of the things that we would typically want to ask is going back to the original general form of a um, first order linear ODE. So we recall that oftentimes it kind of comes in the following form. Um, A1x times dy dx plus A0 um, of x times y is equal to, maybe I'll just call it g of x for right now. And then oftentimes what we would want to do is we would want to take this and put it into the standard form. And oftentimes that involves kind of dividing by, by A1 of x. And then ultimately, that's what brings us to um, the function p of x and the function f of x on the right-hand side. The existence and uniqueness of solutions that we're coming up with depend upon the existence and the continuity of p of x and an f of x. Okay, So from the continuity of p and f on an interval i, that will guarantee and give us the existence and uniqueness of one solution for our initial value problem, provided that that um, initial point for the IVP is in the, the interval of um, continuity for both P and F. Okay, With that in mind, let's take a look at the next example. In example three, we're asked to solve x dy dx minus 4y equals x to the sixth e to the x. Right now, one of the things that we would notice is that this is not in standard form because of the presence of this function x in front of the dy dx. So what that tells us is we have one step in the beginning. We need to divide every single term of the ODE by that function x. Okay. And then what we would get would be the following. We have dy dx minus, I'm going to write it as 4 over x y, and this is going to be equal to, we can reduce this, it'll be x to the fifth e to the x. So what is playing the role of p of x in this case is going to be the negative 4 over x. The thing that's playing the role of uh, f of x in our standard form, that's the x to the fifth e to the x. So let's talk about exactly where our solution can exist. Well, f of x, this is defined for all real numbers. It's just the product of a polynomial times e. Both those functions are good everywhere. So the product will be good everywhere. But when we come over and we investigate and we look at p of x, we see that p of x is not going to be defined when x equals to 0, because that would give us a, a division by 0. So the intervals of definition for p of x would be either from negative infinity to 0 or from 0 to infinity. So those would be the two intervals of definition for, for p of x. Let's solve this differential equation on the, the largest interval. So we'll use this interval here because this, for us, would be the interval which both of them would be um, defined and continuous. So we know we will have a unique solution there. And we'll come back to that later on. We know that in order to solve this linear ODE, we want to find our integrating factor. So the integrating factor was e raised to the integral of p of x dx, which is going to be equal to e raised to the integral of 4 divided by negative x dx. This is equal to e raised to the, you can kind of pull the, the constant out of here, pull out the four and the negative. This is going to be uh, one over x dx. This is e raised to the negative four. And then the antiderivative of one over x is simply the natural log of the absolute value of x. 
Now, what we can consider, remember, our interval of solution, the interval of solution we're looking at is going to be on the interval from 0 to infinity, which means x is positive. So we're actually able to drop those absolute value bars because x is positive in our interval i. And then to simplify this, we can bring the negative 4 into the natural log using the power rule for logs. And then from here, because e and ln are inverses, the e and the ln kind of cancel via composition, and we get x, excuse me, x to the negative fourth. So our integrating factor for this problem is x to the negative fourth. What we now do is we're going to multiply every single term in the equation by our integrating factor. So multiply every single term by this x to the negative fourth. And here's what we're going to end up getting. We know that this produces a exact derivative on the left hand side. That exact derivative is always the integrating factor times y. And then it's going to be equal to on the right hand side. We have a little bit of multiplication by like bases. So we can add those exponents x to the fifth times x to the negative fourth would give us x to the first times e to the x. And then from here, we can finish this problem by simply integrating both sides with respect to x. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to integrate dx to both sides. We're going to integrate the derivative of x to the negative fourth y dx. And we're going to integrate x e to the x dx. On the left-hand side, the in inverse nature of the integral and the derivative, that's going to give us x to the negative fourth times y will be equal to. It's a good little review here from um, Calc 2. To solve this, we need to do integration by parts to find the antiderivative of x e to the x dx. You would let u be the polynomial part. Let dv be the exponential part. Differentiate to get du. That would give us dx. Integrate to v, which would give us e to the x. And then this is equal to, from calc 2, the antiderivative of u dv is equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. So u times v will give us x e to the x minus the integral of v du. That's e to the x dx. So we have our x e to the x term. The antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. And then we don't want to forget, but we have that constant of integration plus c. So the integral of that right-hand side was x e to the x minus e to the x plus c. And now we're almost there. The next thing we can do is you can think of it as one of two ways. To get uh, both sides by itself, you can either divide by the x to the negative fourth, or this would be equivalent to multiplying both sides by um, x to the fourth. Algebraically, it's the same thing. And this gives us our solution. So here these cancel because you would get x to the 0, which is just 1. So we have y equals, if I distribute this in, the first term will become an x to the fifth e to the x minus x to the fourth e to the x plus c x to the fourth. So this is our solution, but let's talk about this solution. If this solution was taken out of a vacuum, and if you looked at it, the thing that's interesting is that this function is actually defined for all real numbers. It's defined for uh, negative infinity to positive infinity because it's just polynomials times exponentials. However, 
as a solution to our differential equation, it's defined on the interval 0 to, to infinity. So keep that in mind here. Okay. What kind of happens is that you know even though this function is defined at 0, going back to our standard form of our differential equation, that function p of x, right? p of x was not defined at x equal to 0, so you cannot use that part, um, that point, as part of the solution. Okay. We give a special name to this. This is what's referred to, so that the value x equal to 0 is referred to as a singular point. Because it's a, a value for which the original ODE would, would not work. Right? So when you write it in standard form, that gives you a singularity of the function p of x. Okay? And in general, to find the singular points, um, you know, they come from where p of x or f of x would not be defined. And here, because we divided by x, when x is equal to 0, that would have given us a division by 0. So that's kind of something we have to be on the lookout for. Again, pay close attention oftentimes to your interval of solution on these. Let's do another one. Let's take a look at example 4. Suppose we have x squared minus 9 dy dx plus xy equals to 0. It's another first order linear ODE. We would again want to start off by kind of getting the function in standard form. To do that, we would need to divide both sides by this coefficient of dy dx, which is x squared minus 9. When we do so, we get the following. These cancel. So we get dy dx plus x over x squared minus 9y would be equal to, on the right-hand side, we get, we get 0. Let's now talk about the, the domain of definition for this thing. So in standard form, again, we can look at the function p of x. p of x is the coefficient of y. It's x divided by x squared minus 9. And then our f of x, in this case, would just be the right-hand side. Um, this is just the function f of x equal to 0. Constant functions are defined everywhere, so that has domain all real numbers. But for p of x, we know that the denominator cannot be 0. So x squared minus 9 cannot be equal to 0, which means that x squared can't be 9, which means that x cannot be equal to plus or minus the square root of 9 is 3. So for p of x, it has kind of three intervals of, of definition. It's defined from negative infinity to negative 3, from negative 3 to 3, and then again it's defined from 3 to, to positive infinity. And if we come up with a solution to this differential equation in general, it's going to have to be on one of these three subintervals. Okay, uh, for argument's sake, I don't know. Let's just choose the, choose the last one. If you want solutions on the other intervals, that's not a big deal. That we can come up with that as well. Um, but let's just pick a an interval of definition for this solution. So we're going to be solving this differential equation on uh, three to infinity. To solve it, we need to find our integrating factor. That's going to be e to the integral of our p of x dx. This is going to be e to the integral of x divided by x squared minus 9 dx. This integration can be done via a u sub. Let u equal the denominator, x squared minus 9. Then du would be equal to 2x dx. So we can rewrite this 
I would need to put an extra two factor on the inside of our antiderivative, which means I would need to put a, a one half on the outside. This would then become e to the one half the integral of one over u du. That would integrate to the natural log of the absolute value of u, which would be equal to e to the one half the natural log of x squared minus nine. And kind of the reason why I wanted to take this interval a moment ago is x squared minus nine is positive on this interval. And so I can simply just rewrite this as the natural log of x squared minus nine. I don't need the absolute value bars if I work on this interval from three to infinity. Conversely, if we'd worked on the interval from negative infinity to negative three, you wouldn't have needed it either because x squared minus nine is also positive um, on this interval as well. So this is also a solution on, on that interval too. We can rewrite our integrating factor to kind of simplify this a little bit. So right now we have the following. This is equal to e to the ln. Let's bring that uh, one half power into the inside as a power from the power rule for logs. The e and the ln cancel. And we get the following. We get x squared minus 9 to the 1 half power. So this is our integrating factor. The next step is we're going to take our differential equation and we're going to multiply both sides by this factor. dy dx plus this is x over x squared minus 9y equal to this thing times 0. And we know that that allows us to write the left hand side as a total derivative, an exact derivative. That is the integrating factor times our solution function y. And on the right hand side, anything times 0 is simply going to be to be 0. We can now solve by integrating both sides with respect to x. So I have my d dx of x squared minus 9 to the 1 half times y equals to 0. And we're integrating both sides dx. As we've seen a bunch of times already, the integral and the derivative cancel. So we get x squared minus 9 to the 1 half y equals the antiderivative of 0 is simply going to be a, a constant. And then to get the y by itself, we can divide both sides by x squared minus 9 to the 1 half by x squared minus 9 to the 1 half. So y equals c divided by x squared minus 9 to the 1 half. And we would take this solution to be on the interval positive 3 to infinity. This equation, by the way, is undefined. So if you were to look at this, this function, it would be undefined for both x equals um, plus or minus 3. And those would have been the, the singular points of this differential equation. So going back to where we had um, p of x. So p of x was our what? x divided by x squared minus 9. It was also the coefficient of the dy dx term. So you know I could also have called um, the a1 of x piece x squared minus 9. It's the zeros of this thing 
are the places where p of x is, is undefined. So when x squared was e minus 9 equals to 0, that's when x equals 2 to plus and minus 3, and that gave us our singular points on this one. It's a little bit easier to spot in our solution this time because this solution was undefined at those singular points. But you also have to be on the lookout because if you go back to example 3, x equals to 0 was a singular point for that differential equation, yet it might have been easy to miss if you didn't look at it up front because the solutions actually would have been defined for x equals to 0, even though that wasn't part of the interval of solution for that differential equation. Let's take a look at um, another one. Take a look at example 5. Let's actually do an IVP problem. Let's solve the linear first order differential equation dy dx um, plus y equals to, to x. This one is already in standard form. The p of x function would be equal to 1. The coefficient of y is just 1. So our integrating factor is going to be e to the integral of p of x dx. This is e to the integral of 1 dx, which is just going to be good old e to the x. So our, we have our integrating factor. We're going to multiply every single term of the differential equation by e to the x. This is going to turn the left-hand side into a total derivative. It's the integrating factor times y will be equal to x times e to the x. And now we can go ahead and solve this differential equation by integrating both sides dx. On the left hand side we get e to the x y equals this antiderivative we just did in the last example. If you recall that was x e to the x plus to me minus e to the x plus c. Divide everything by e to the x. And we get that the general solution is y equals, these would cancel, so we have x minus, these would cancel 1, plus, um, how do I want to write it? Uh, we'll bring it up. We'll call it c e to the negative x. So instead of writing a fraction, we'll do it like that. And let's suppose we wanted the initial value problem such that y of 0 equals to 4. Whenever we plug 0 in for x, we get the y value of 4. So this is going to look like 4 equals 0 minus 1 plus c e to the negative 0. e to the 0 is 1, so we get c equals 1, don't forget my negative sign there, negative 1 plus c times 1 is c, and then we add 1 to both sides, and we would get that the value of c would be equal to, to 5. So going back, our original differential equation with the initial value y of 0 equals to 4 would have the particular solution y equals x minus 1 plus 5e e to the negative x. Okay. So that would be our particular solution.